um, that's got, I mean, really short. It's got to be tough. It like, it was, she never mentioned it. She never wrote about it. Nothing. It's like, she wasn't short in her eyes. It's all about how we perceive ourselves. And um, uh, I just want to remind everybody, that this is uh, most of her life. I mean, she started her life like 140 years ago. And it was not cool. I mean, you could be short at any time in history, of course, but it was definitely uh, not a simple thing to be a woman activist at the time. She didn't write a lot about that, but she wrote enough that hopefully we'll touch on it. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, but in general, I'm just telling her story. The problem about Manya Shochat is that there are very few sources in English or in Hebrew that give an entire picture of her life. She didn't write her life story, she just wrote parts of it. And you have to pick and choose. And um, there's one book that was written by a good friend of hers, um, Rachel Yanait Bensvi, the first lady of Israel for many years, uh, who was her good friend. And she wrote a book that was translated into English called Before Golda. It's a very good book, uh, but it doesn't tell all of the stuff, especially the stuff that uh, you wouldn't tell about your best friend. But Manya didn't have such a big problem telling about. Another book is uh, a cool book called, this probably looks uh, backwards, but it's called The Plow Woman. And this is an incredible book about um, women who did uh, manual labor in pre-state Israel and Palestine. So her story uh, starts in Russia. She's, uh, Manya is a very Russian woman. And look at the way she's, her, her look, her look is the look of a revolutionary at the turn of the century. Short cropped hair and wireframe glasses. And if you can, a beret would be cool. Uh, that was uh, her trademark. She stayed that way with the glasses and the hair the entire time. It was a statement. I am a revolutionary and I don't do, do things that everybody else does. So she started, she had a very long Ashkenazic name, Manya Wildushevsky, Wildushevitz actually. And um, her, you could write a book about her family because she was one of uh, 10 kids. And her family was not a normal family. It was very, nothing was normal about Manya. So she was born in 1880, almost exactly 140 years ago, uh, in Lithuania, uh, what is today uh, Belarus. And her parents were middle class, um, had a lot of kids, but the, the parents did not get along. Her mother was very, very progressive, but too progressive for her father's taste. He decided to uh, become ultra-Orthodox uh, with a very, very progressive wife. They did not agree on stuff, but they knew this when they were getting married, and it didn't stop them from getting married, even though they didn't live together most of their lives. And that was considered okay for them. In their ketubah, uh, there was a condition that she would not cut off her braid, Manya's mother, Sarah. In other words, if she were to cut off her braid, she would look too progressive. And um, it was part of the ketubah, uh, whatever. Um, and on the other side of the coin, about every year and a half, she was pregnant. And um, they had a lot of kids, but, and 10 altogether. But after the seventh uh, child, Moshe, uh, Manya's older brother, was born, um, she didn't want to have any more kids. He didn't really ask her. So what she did was she went to her brothers-in-law who lived in another city and got an abortion every single time um, without her husband knowing that she was pregnant. So already her mother is like very secretive, undercover, but, will, but gets along with people, all kinds of compromises. These, her brothers-in-laws were physicians and they were able to keep the secret. But at some point, they moved away very far away in huge Russia, and she had no one to turn with, to turn to, and that's how Manya got born. So uh, that may be somewhat symbolic. The, um, uh, she went into postpartum uh, depression afterwards and couldn't take care of Manya, and uh, Manya couldn't nurse, and um, her brother took care of her uh, because her mother couldn't. 
And um, uh, he later became a follower of Tolstoy, which was kind of like a, a hippie kind of a thing where you'd be, you'd, wear, you'd grow your hair long, uh, the men, right? The women, the, the, you would, you'd, be a, you'd be a vegetarian. And um, he specifically said, I am guided by two principles. One, do no evil. And two, do manual labor. And he worked in a number of flour mills. Their father, by the way, owned a flour mill, but he refused to work in his father's flour mill. He wanted to work on his own. Then his mother begged him, please, come on, work with your father. Come on, it's not nice. And so he agreed to do that for a while. And then he started taking over. Um, he wasn't married. He didn't want to get married by principle. But a woman once visited the mill and fell into one of the contraptions. And uh, she had to have her leg amputated. And Moshe felt uh, responsible for her. So he married her. Unbelievable. And they fell in love after they got married. Um, that's very powerful idea. Uh, afterwards, she, she died and he cremated her and had her ashes on his table, uh, his work desk. Uh, he actually um, was an incredible engineer. He had over 100 patents. And one of the things he invented was margarine, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, when there's a butter uh, shortage in Israel, you can say thank you to Moshe Wilbushevitz. Um, he, uh, he was able to get oil from cotton. He made it oil for churches that didn't make smoke that they could, uh, um, that they could use. And um, he became the head of a huge factory with thousands of workers. And he made sure they only worked for eight hours, which is unheard of back then. And he made sure that they all got schooling. And of course, there was no work on uh, May the 1st. But he made so much money that he got bored and he went to Switzerland. And, um, and he met Lenin there <laughs> before the revolution. And, uh, and uh, uh, Lenin said, you know what? I'm going back to Russia on a train, famous train ride, to go back and start the revolution. Come with me and lead the people. And you know, you're a socialist. And Moshe said, no, I'm, I'm busy right now. He said, what do you, you're not busy. What are you doing? He said, I gotta think. I have to think what my next step is. Now, this is something that had to do with Manya because she did not, when she started a project, she gathered a lot of data beforehand. That doesn't mean she wasn't impulsive, but he had a huge uh, effect on her. Um, after the revolution, by the way, there was this huge dip in the economy, in the world economy, and people became very, very poor. People who were rich became poor. And Moshe was starving in Switzerland, but uh, Lenin sent him uh, a monthly stipend, like a scholarship of a thousand rubles a month. And he wrote to him and said, this is for you to be able to sit and think. Like there should be people who should just think and come up with ideas. And he came up with some pretty incredible ideas. Later on, he moved to Israel and um, he had invented uh, artificial milk, the first person, but he decided uh, that's not good for people. So he tried not to produce any of it and he started uh, making what he called intelligent food. This is way before people ate you know, healthy. Uh, he lived on Mount Scopus and, um, and, um, uh, and Manya said of him, I loved him more than anything in the world. He had the strongest influence on my spiritual life. Um, now, that's just one of the brothers. That was one of the more stable brothers. Uh, when uh, she had another older brother named Yitzchak, who when he was 21, he got depressed because he fell in love with a woman who didn't love him back. And he jumped into the river to commit suicide. And Manya was four at the time, four. This many fingers, she jumped in afterwards to save him. Uh, that's Manya in the back there with the glasses. Uh, um, that uh, she was four. So obviously she started drowning too and the passerbys came, saved her, same Yitzchak, and uh, he went on to study agriculture in Russia. And in university, one of his professors when lecturing said, the Jews are sucking the blood of the farmers of the Ukraine. And uh, Yitzchak stood up, slapped him in the face, and was expelled from the university. And later he made Aliyah, but his letters home made a big influence on Manya, but she wasn't interested in moving to Israel. So when she was 12, 
some uh, boys, Russian boys, made anti-Semitic remarks to her, and she took poison. You know, there was something in this family that is as um, has to do with suicide. Um, it was some kind of hereditary uh, trait. It's not news. It happens. Mental health is just like physical health can be handed down from generation. And um, but it was also something that you did um, as a statement. You made a statement by ending your life. It wasn't just oh. This is sad. And she wanted to make a statement about anti-Semitism by killing herself, but her father found her in time and saved her. Uh, her older sister, Frenya, also uh, killed herself at the age of 21 because of a failed love affair. And uh, she had another sister, Anna, who killed herself when she was 45. So this is something that's going to be part of Manya's life, the option of suicide, um, which, which makes life very um precarious um so she had another brother named gedalia he made alia also later um uh, uh, manya was a teenager she started reading books she really liked the cause of the peasants and she said i love russia very much and believed like the authors of the books that i read that russia had a mission in the world russia would bring the new socialist truth to the decayed old world when she was 45, she dressed up as a boy and ran away from home to the city of Lodz because she wanted to become a worker, part of the working class. And they gave this little girl, who was even tinier when she was 14, she schlepped sacks in a sack factory. I wish I had a picture of that because it would have been very entertaining. Um, this lasted for about a year. When she was 15, she um, left... Uh, for Minsk, a big city in the area, with a pistol that Moshe gave to her to defend herself. And she began working in a crate factory of her brother Gedalia, making crates. So she was a carpenter, and women did not do that at the time. So already she was a revolutionary uh, person working in her brother's factory, and she lived with her brother. Now she felt that she, he wasn't treating the workers right. <laughs> so she started a strike in her brother's factory. Um, and that's Manya, okay? Like she talked to him about it and he didn't agree. So she, she started a strike and she stayed, continued living there. So she wasn't afraid of anybody. She, she was honest, she spoke her mind and she would pay the price if she needed to pay the price. Like he could have kicked her out, but he didn't because she realized she was doing it for good reasons. Um, so she says, from childhood, I remember myself being among workers who were usually non-Jewish. In those days, the workday was 16 hours long and the conditions, which have since become obsolete, were very harsh. Thanks to the improvements, she's being cynical, that my father brought to the machinery in his flour mill, disasters were always happening. Workers lost an arm and a leg, and I saw it happen a number of times. Um, and on summer holidays, vacationers came to our village, and this reality created the following picture in my mind. There's two kinds of people in the world, elegant idlers, educated and wealthy, and unsightly manual laborers, poor and ignorant, whose lives end in disasters, they are martyrs. The more I delved into the daily lives of workers, the more I was haunted by the question of how to transform the masses of workers into masters of their own fate without relying on intelligentsia who don't understand them and don't love them with the simple love of one man to another. She was a true socialist. In other words, she, I don't, so much mean the political um, meaning that we attach to socialism. She wanted social justice for everybody, Jew or not Jew. And she became a member of a very revolutionary um, a movement in Russia called the Narodniks, which means the people's will. And this included a certain kind of terrorism, not the terrorism that let's say we have in the Middle East. It's a certain kind of terrorism. I'm not saying that it's ethical, but they would assassinate leaders. In other words, not they wouldn't put a bomb on a bus or just kill people. They would find a leader who was doing evil and they would kill that person. So yes, it was terrorism, but it was directed terrorism and they were okay with it. And Manya, of course, was okay with it because she was a revolutionary. When she was 18, she heard about people, non-Jewish people in Kazan, which is far away. She went and taught and distributed food to starving people. 
Um, this is a classic story of Manya, who, who, who studied things before she went on, but was also very impulsive. On her way back to Minsk, the members of this mission met a Russian army unit about to do a trial with a hot air balloon. And they thought that these guys were crazy, but she said, you guys go back to Minsk, I'm gonna go. They invited her to come. They invited her to come with her on the hot air balloon. So she was like, how can I miss this? So she, she just made, she just joined the flight and a storm blew them off course. And they, they landed the next morning in some remote village and the people thought that they were actually part of the devil. They came out with pitchforks, kind of like the Shrek kind of a thing. And, <laughs> and they, started cross <laughs> they started crossing themselves uh, and then the people stopped uh, trying to kill them and uh, they, they, they were saved. Now, something very important happened when she was 19 because when she was 19, the Russian secret police, now remember at the time, the czarist regime is going on very not socialist in Russia. And they are very wary, obviously, of socialist activists, and the Jews were part of that. And uh, the uh, Russian secret police, known as the Okhrana, uh, rounded up Jewish activists in Minsk, and she was arrested too. She was interrogated for long hours. She laughed at it, and she joked along with their interrogators. And they put her in a dark cell and put rats in there so they would bother her. And she said, I kind of, uh, I pretended that they were cats and I could, and, and I could uh, call them and they'd come to me. And then none of that bothered me. But then they did something very mean and, uh, and that worked actually on Manya. And they threatened that if she didn't give them names of, of three other activists that they, they knew she knew, uh, they would imprison 140 carpenters from her brother Gedalia's factory. And so she writes, only a writer like Dostoevsky could describe the full terror of the spiritual inquisition I underwent for more than a week. I found no solution to the problem. Should I betray three revolutionaries to save 140 people who are not revolutionaries? During those days, I went completely mad and tried to hang myself, but they kept me constantly under surveillance and several times they took away the ropes I had braided and clothes I tore up. She again tried to commit suicide, and it's hard to judge her here because she was, she was really being tortured. They found the way to do it. And then she met someone who changed her life, and, and, and she changed his life. The head of the secret police um, was a guy named Zubatov, and they met during an interrogation, and they clicked. Now, now, we don't know exactly what's happening. We don't know if they had an affair or they just had this deep soul relationship, but they became really, really close. And they came up, Zubatov came up with a great idea that Manya thought was also good. He said, let's, let's have a compromise. Let's do this. We'll let you go and you will continue to organize Jewish workers and you'll have tame organizations and you'll still work for reform, but you won't try to make a revolution. And she was like, that's great. That's exactly what I want. I don't really care if there's a revolution or not. I want better terms for the workers. And if this will help, that's great. Um, and uh, uh, other people thought that she was uh, making a truce with the devil, but um, he let her go. Uh, and she went back to the factory and was very, very active. And every time there was a strike, the police knew about it. Not a big deal. But the workers' conditions were made better. Um, and then something happened. One of the terrible things that happened that changed a lot of people's lives in the Jewish world, especially in 1903, there were, was a huge pogrom in Kishinev. Now it wasn't so huge. Uh, these are pictures of, uh, there are more graphic ones that we're not going to use, but just hundreds of people who were butchered and it was done with, uh, with the help of, uh, uh, the czarist regime. Now, there's, there's a few things that happened uh, to set this up. Um, there, we already know that in the late 1800s, 1898, Herzl spoke and started in Basel, Switzerland, the first Zionist Congress. That was a huge thing. Um, and Manya wanted to have a Zionist Congress in Russia. Now, it never happened before and it never happened afterwards, but they agreed if she was going to be one of the organizers, because they felt that they could rely on her. So she starts this uh, Zionist Congress in Russia, 
and the secret police are there and they're listening and they realize that the, the Jews are not just talking about uh, going to Israel, which is what they thought Zionism was all about, but because these folks were socialist revolutionaries, they also talked about helping other peoples who, were, who needed to have freedom. And then they thought, this is terrible, because if it was just Aliyah, the Russians actually were very happy to get rid of the Jews. This is a great idea for them, because the Jews would get out of Russia, and they were happy with that. But once they realized that they were troublemakers, because they wanted to help the world, then they said, that's it. And when they found out about that, um, they uh, disbanded the compromise that they had. Zubatov was sent to Siberia, he later shot himself. That's another story. The head of the interior ministry um, uh, wanted to teach the Jews a lesson and stop them from being activists. And they actually uh, instigated with the help of the press and the government and the police and some of the clergy, these terrible pogroms in um, Kishinev, which had huge, huge waves. A lot of people left Russia because of that which is what they wanted, but um, not everybody was able to. And um, uh, this was obvious to uh, Manya that uh, she's got to stop this. And she decided she's got to kill the interior minister of Russia. And um, she went to Berlin to raise money for this plan. They were going to dig this tunnel underneath his house and uh, take care of him there. But while she was in Berlin getting money, uh, her fellow plotters had been informed on, arrested, and all executed. And she fell into a deep depression and apparently took a lot of sleeping pills. Yes, one more time. Her brother Gedalia knew about this, uh, saved her. And then he did something that brothers often do, and he tricked his sister. He asked his brother in Israel, Nachum, to write a letter that he's very, very ill, and he needs Manya to come and take care of him and say goodbye to him before he dies. All made up because he knew he had to get Manya out of depression. Sent her there. She went there, believed everything. When she got there, you know, he's like, Yeah, here you are. She said, I thought you were in your deathbed. He said, I lied. So she turned around and went back to Jaffa to get on the boat, but the boat had left already. So she's stuck. Okay. So he says, Listen, I have a great idea. Come with me. I'm going on a trip for six weeks. And I'm, uh, this man was also an amazing engineer. He, started the reading uh, electrical company in uh, uh, the electrical plant in Tel Aviv, Northern Tel Aviv. He had all kinds of stuff he, that he, they were these great inventors. They were very creative. And uh, he said, I, I also want to uh, think about mining in Israel. Uh, and I need to go around the country. And it's going to be six weeks with two friends of mine, four horses. Are you willing? And she was like, yeah, whatever. Because she didn't have anything else to, to live for as it were. And they, uh, for six weeks, for 10 to 12 hours, they rode on horses. She fell in love with the land. It was nothing like anything she'd seen before. She met Arabs and wanted to learn Arabic. She met Jews and wanted to learn about Judaism a little more. And they, you know, slept underneath the stars. And one man from Rehovot says, one winter day in 1904, when I was on my way home from the vineyard, I came across a strange group in the street, two pairs of riders, two men and two women, and one of the women was wearing man's clothing, boots, and a hat, man's hat. I never saw a woman rider like that before. And her name was Manya. Um, so she finds out that there's uh, a possibility to uh, start a socialist farming possibility in the Horan, which is not far from the Golan Heights. And it belonged to Baron Rothschild. He bought it. Actually, still is owned by Baron Rothschild. Uh, and it's in Syria, so you can just dream about it, but it's, it's still Jewish land. And um, she decided she is going to settle it. And so she went around for an entire year and uh, did research on the 24 Jewish farms that were there, and they were all doing terrible and losing money. She went to the baron and said, listen, I can make it work. I need, I need money to start this. He said, no, you can use my land, but I'm not giving you any money. I don't have any money for that plan. And she said, well, you know, there's, there were pogroms in Kishinev. There's going to be more pogroms. And I want to start a Jewish to sell self-defense movement in Russia. Will you give me money for that? And she said, he said, yes, I'll give you 50,000 francs 
which is a huge amount of money, but you can't say that you got it from me. She took this money. This is the craziest story of all, by the way. And then we'll move back to Israel. But uh, she, she went to Belgium to, a, to an arms factory and she bought like a train load of arms and weapons and ammunition. And now she had to smuggle it. So she would dress up in a different disguise, which she did all her life, by the way. She was a master of disguises. And she dressed up, first of all, as a very elegant French woman. And she was transporting dresses. She went four times across different borders and she put the dresses around the arms and got them uh, into Russia. Her, the last of the four shipments that she took uh, were crates and she dressed up as an ultra orthodox woman who was, <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, that's not what was funny. But she, just, she said, I'm transporting holy books to yeshivas in Russia. So around the weapons, she just put all these uh, books in Hebrew. And of course, nobody knew what was going on there and they let her in. Um, she brought it to an apartment and um, she looks out the window and she's waiting for the underground to come so that she can give out the arms like she had before. And she sees this policeman around the area. So she realizes something's wrong. And then there's a knock on her door and a guy faints outside of her door. He opens, she opens the door. She takes him in and he's talking, saying stupid things. And he realizes, she realizes he's, something's wrong with him. And she gives him water and it turns out he faked it. And so she, she had, she was like really intelligent and a great spy, but she also had this soft, very naive part about her that she believed the letter of her brother. She believed the uh, uh, Russian interrogator. She believed this man. And he says, just show me where the weapons are and I'll make sure they don't kill you. So she realizes if she tells him and doesn't do anything, he's gonna go out and let everybody know. These, these um, guns are not gonna get to, to where they need to be. And uh, she, when, she, when she bought the trainload of guns in Belgium, they gave her, because she bought so much, they gave her a pistol with a silencer as a gift, okay? She took it out of her coat and shot him, he died. Now, she, she didn't realize, she writes afterwards, I knew I killed him, but I, I didn't really understand exactly what happened. This is a terrible story, by the way, and I apologize if it grosses you out. But when in the end, the underground, the policeman just left because no, nothing happened. And uh, the underground folks came and she said, look, there's this dead man here and let's put him in a box and I'm gonna send him somewhere. And um, he wouldn't fit, so they had to, make him fit and she said that's when i realized i'd killed someone so there's something about this woman who's who's and i'm not trying to make her look like a tzadika because she wasn't but um there was a lot of conflict going on there she was simple she was she was incredibly intelligent she was a master of disguises but she would be fooled by other people's disguises she wanted peace and she wanted to help workers but she killed a person um, Murder, yeah, it was murder. Yeah, maybe it was justified, but anyway, they put him in a box. She took him with some porters to the train station, wrote a fictitious, <laughs> wrote a fictitious address, and who knows where he is today. But um, those arms made it, and a year later, there were um, uh, pogroms, worse pogroms in 1905, 1906 in Russia. For the first time, Jews defended themselves with those arms. Manya actually was there and actually helped in one of the pogroms to stop the massacres. It's a crazy story, but uh, she went to do research and in the end, uh, what she did is she came back and she found a farm in a place called Sedger in the, in the Lower Galilee. Um, and uh, she started a collective there. This was called the collective. It was an idea that she learned about. She actually went to the United States and Canada she started a commune in New York City. Now, I'm not making this up, but she actually started a commune with Russians in New York City. She was actually part of it for a while, and then she left after she started it. In Canada also, there were Russian non-Jews who started a commune. She learned from them, went back to Israel, and started in Sedra, the first collective farm, which was, of course was the precursor of the kibbutz movement. Uh, it's hard even to believe that Manya Without her, we don't really know. I mean, maybe there would be kibbutzim or something like it, but she was the first one who did it, and she did it in the Lower Galilee. 
when she got the okay to do it, they said, look, you can do it for a year. We'll see if you make a profit because no Jewish farmer had made a profit. And she, after a year, made a profit. It was unbelievable. But life was very hard. And we'll see why. There's this picture of dancing here because she needed people to come and work. And that's when her husband, she met her husband, who was working with orphans from Kishinev. And they, he started a Jewish self-defense movement called Bar Giora, named for um, a mythic uh, man mentioned in the Midrash as somebody who was uh, fought against the Romans in the, the great uh, revolt against the Romans when the temple was destroyed. And they came to Sedra and they made a profit, but life was really hard. And she writes, there was one thing that got us out of our depression, dancing. I want to read you a story that we read often and leave note uh, uh, before and, and various hikes and leave note. And it is definitely my favorite uh, Manya story, even though it's not directly about her, but it really tells about her. And then we'll try to finish up her life story. And Manya is writing, we had been anxiously waiting for two entire weeks for a truck of salvation with canned goods that would come from Haifa. It still hadn't arrived. Meanwhile, we finished off everything we had. Our cupboards were empty, no beans, no rice, no oil. Long before that, we stopped even dreaming about tea and sugar. Everybody had just two things, bread and onions. And there were a lot of onions that year. So we couldn't cook that day. Lunch hour was in a little while. Soon the chaver are gonna come back from the field, hungry, tired, and wet, because it rained the entire morning. And what are we gonna tell them? The woman responsible in the kitchen broke down and cried and ran away. And I tried to sit in the dining hall, gloomy and sad, I put bread and onions on the table, that's all that there was. And then one of the pioneers named Luca came in. He was a handsome young man, always cheerful, never upset, full of life, brave, faithful. And he says, Manya, why are you so depressed? What happened? And I, full of bitterness, spilled out my gut storm. There's nothing to serve the chevra. The treasurer didn't send me anything. The situation is getting worse today to day. How can we go on like this? And he looked at me smiling with this jolly voice and he said, that's it? That's your tragedy? So we won't eat for a few days. So you don't die from that. In fact, you don't even get an upset stomach from that. And besides, don't you know that we're just the fertilizer for the next generation? Now, that's a very powerful idea. In other words, this man is living. He, he knows there's going to be a state of Israel. They're doing this and building down the foundations for the future state of Israel. He's fertilizer. He doesn't really mean he's fertilizer. He's just saying, you know, whatever you need, I'm going to do it because it's not about me. It's about what's going to happen. I looked at him fully attentive to his words, and suddenly my heart lightened up. Luke is right. If we're just a fertilizer for the next generation, then we should be measuring our daily hardships with a different ruler. And he got me being cheerful too. Just then the chevra started coming in from the field, tired and wet. I stood there and greeted them with joy. Chevra, we couldn't cook today because the treasure didn't send any goods. All we have is bread and onions, but don't you worry. Luca says we're just a fertilizer for the next generation. And then there was a short silence. Suddenly, one chevra takes a big onion from the table, goes out with it in the middle of the dining hall, and starts a funny dance. Putting the onion on his head, he says, Luca will build the Galilee. God will build the Galilee, a famous song that we saw people dancing to. Others joined in, everyone with their own onion. A wild circle of dancing ensued. The dining hall fills up with true joy and powerful singing. God will build the Galilee. Luca will build the Galilee. And that people had a very hard life in this time, but they, what kept them going is that they knew somehow that this was just the foundation for the next generation. Uh, afterwards, what happened is that her husband started the Hashomer organization, which you can see here, people dressed up like Arabs, who at the time, you could see one man even with a slingshot, like the kind David had. And uh, they want to be biblical, and they also want to be Arab. The Arabs were the only ones who knew how to shoot a gun, ride a horse, and they were the guards. And they wanted to do their own guarding. They also wanted to do their own farming. And it's very important not to think that these people were racist. They weren't like, oh, we don't, want, we don't like Arabs. We don't want them to guard, and we don't want them to work. It wasn't about that. For those who've been on a kibbutz or know like the ideal of many kibbutzim in the past and just a few today, um, some of which many of you have, have been on, is that we want to do our own work. It doesn't mean we're anti-others. We want to do our own work. And look how they're all dressing here like 
uh, many of the Bedouin and Arab farmers, they actually respected them. And every Saturday night, um, uh, Manya's husband would go and meet with the Arabs and try to have good relations. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Uh, and afterwards, uh, uh, the Hashomer movement started and uh, things totally changed in Israel. The Hashomer movement morphed into the Haganah movement and uh, that was uh, something new that happened. There was a national movement to defend Jews from every bad thing that could possibly happen. And um, uh, within just a few sentences, I'll try to say exactly what happened. World War I was spent in Turkey because the Turks expelled the leaders, uh, the Zionist leaders from Israel. They spent that time abroad. They had two kids. Um, they came back and started a new kibbutz way up north near Metula called Kfar Giladi. And um, they really were interested in human, in equal rights. And I just want to say something about women's rights. That's her husband. Look at this man. Look at that guy. They said when he talked, everybody listened. <laughs> he looks like, like a hypnotist. Um, and you can imagine what kind of power it would be when he and Manya would go and talk. You've got all this incredible energy. So women wanted to be in Hashomer. And Manya was in Hashomer. But other women couldn't join. There were like three women out of uh, about 100. So they started a strike. The women said, the wives of the Hashomer guard said, we want to be in it too. So they had a special meeting. The women started throwing rocks at the window where the men were having a meeting. And their strike lasted 15 minutes. Because after 15 minutes of deliberating, they decided, of course, the women are going to join. So they let the women in Hashomer. So they asked Manya, why didn't you work for women? You were in Hashomer. How could you not have been a woman's activist and tell these guys that they needed to accept women? Now listen to her answer, because it's very, very important. She said, we, all of us, the men and the women in Hashomer, we were all poor together. We were all hungry together. We all guarded together. We, we held arms together. We defended together. The difference between me and the other women who were not in Hashomer and wanted inside is that for me, this was my job. This was my mission. The other women were simply wives of Hashomer guards that wanted to have equal rights. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But I wasn't doing it because I was, I was doing it because it was my mission in life. She wasn't even looking at gender. It was way past gender. She was, she was I, I'm not, of course, trying to hint that it's not important, but like she wasn't there. She was in a different place. And by the way, later on, uh, as we're getting towards the end, going to have to jump towards the end of her life. She met a woman in the United States when she was there named Henrietta Zoll. And uh, when Henrietta was about 73, it was in the early 1930s, she spoke out and said, this woman is amazing. Why, doesn't, why don't people tap her for some great job? She's being wasted. She is, she, she's incredible. Um, and a year later, she became head of Youth Aliyah and saved tens of thousands of lives of kids um, uh, before, during, and after the Holocaust, bringing them to Israel and to other places. And that was her life's mission. In other words, you have a life's mission, and that's what you do. So she's getting older. You can see she has gray hair. She still has that, that revolutionary look. Um, and uh, when they came back after World War I, they were not in power anymore. And the British were in charge, and there was a whole different leadership. and what they did was they started one last thing, which is a labor legion. Uh, Mayor showed a picture uh, a few minutes ago of uh, people working, uh, uh, paving the road. The, that's right next to the Kinneret. You can see that's Highway 90 as it comes up from Tiberias up towards Rosh Pina. And they made a road with their own hands. And this is something that Manya started. She wanted to have a commune of workers because she believed in people doing manual labor. So that was the last thing that she did. Um, and she tried to become a mother, but she couldn't because she was always gone arranging things. And uh, her children really suffered. Her oldest son, Gidon, was grown up, was raised by the kibbutz because she was never there. Uh, but he understood and he was with the gang most of the time. Her daughter, Anna, was pretty furious about her. Um, and uh, she wrote to him, uh, to her mother once and, and said the following, Answer me, mother. 
you'll probably come home for a day or two and be as busy as usual, and you won't have time to talk to me as usual. So she got her a puppy. I mean, that's cute, but like, she said, well, you don't have a mother, you don't have a father, and you don't have a brother to go to, because her brother lived off the kibbutz, as the kids did, and when in the sleepaway high school, so here's a puppy. I mean, it's cute, but it's not what a mother, so her daughter was really upset at her. Um, and lastly, the last amazing thing that she did was during World War II, at the very beginning, she went to Russia, uh, she went to London, to the Russian embassy, and she said, I want to organize with you 1,000 Jewish people who will go behind Nazi lines and uh, start revolutions against the Nazis. And the Russians were like, thank you very much. Uh, we have our own plans. Later, the British actually did this with Hannah Senesh and the whole story of the paratroopers who went behind lines. During the war in 1948, she was visiting her nephew in Haifa, and there were a lot of battles in Haifa. And the last great story, she's walking and she walks right by an Arab army post, a military post, and they're like, where are you going to? She says, I'm going to see my nephew. He says, now? Where are you going now? He says, I want to see him. He said, you know, we're killing Jews now. And she says, they're not going to kill me. I said, why not? So what did I ever do to hurt you that would make you want to kill me? And they let her go. Like, what is that? It's, it's being a simpleton, right? But on the other hand, it worked. And she didn't disguise herself. Um, she disguised herself as a nurse during the pogroms in, 19, in, in Jaffa and the Arab riots in 1929, 1921, 1929, 1936. But in the end, she grew weak. She went back to the kibbutz. Her kids had already left. Um, she moved to Tel Aviv to be with her husband. They'd split. They didn't divorce, but they didn't live together. It wasn't really a normal family. She uh, had a lot of problems with her vision uh, in her last years. She had an operation, and as soon as she could, she got up and started making sure the other patients were okay. That was the kind of person she was. We all have grandmothers like that, you know. Um, and uh, she died in 1961 at the age of 81 and is buried next to the roaring lion there um, in Tel Chai. The last thing, her children, that's a, the last, one of her last pictures. She's still adorable. I mean, don't you just want to hug her? Look at her. And um, still a revolutionary. Um, I'll just say, Lastly, about her kids and her legacy, and then we'll finish. Uh, her son, Gidon, became a pilot for the British and then started one of the first pilots in the new Israeli Air Force. Um, he didn't have a, a stable family life and uh, divorced and then killed himself in 1967. Again, it's, it's something hereditary. Anna... Uh, left the kibbutz as early as she could. She did not like that kibbutz. She also tried a number of times to have a family, it didn't work. In the end, she, found, she became a psychologist, a very well-known one, and lived with her third husband at her, his kibbutz for about 50 years, and in the end had stability in her life, which she wanted. And um, she had a daughter who said of her grandmother, Manya was a great grandma. Sometimes I think she tried to atone for her lack of being a good mother, by being a great grandmother. She believed in two principles which she once wrote in a message to a bar mitzvah boy, Kfar Giladi, be loyal and be responsible. So if I were to sum up her life, there are, I'd say five things. Uh, there's one subject I didn't even talk about that's too broad, that she really tried to have good relations with Arabs and give them equal rights. Uh, there was um, martial law here until the early 60s. She wrote to Ben-Gurion and said, stop martial law. We don't need it. It's not good. We've got to work with the Arabs of the country. This is not good. And she would do things that people would think would be very left-wing and things that people would think would be very right-wing, and she didn't find a conflict in it. That was part of her life. She was able to take things that most people don't mix together in a salad and make it work. So if I were to, to mention five things that... Um, that she really changed the world with, it would be the following. Number one, the kibbutz. She really came up with this idea of farmers working together and doing it and living in a communal setting. Um, saving Jewish lives was definitely one of the big things in her life. She would not sit still if she knew that Jews were being killed. Uh, social justice, which means the working class and any person who everybody has equal rights, Russians, Jews, women, Arabs, it doesn't matter. Everybody, we need to work for social justice for everyone. Number four is manual labor. Uh, 
it's very important to do manual labor at some part in your life. This was holy for her. And when she was very old in her last years, people would come and get advice from her for obvious reasons. And uh, she couldn't answer them unless she was working. So she'd say, wait a sec, she'd get uh, clothes that were torn and she would uh, sew them together for the kibbutz. And once she was sewing, then she could talk to them. Like manual labor was part of, of, her, of her life. It wasn't just, let's do some manual labor for a year or so, like myself. Um, but I married someone who came from a village from manual labor. And the last thing was building bridges. She built bridges with people who were very different from her, whether it be the Russian secret police, whether it be uh, nationalist Arabs in the land of Israel. She didn't uh, find a contradiction in being an activist for anybody. And she's a very, very inspiring person. Uh, one of the uh, historians of this period says um, she was very much like her kids. She was a pilot like Gidon, and she was a psychologist like Anna. And I think that really sums it up. She was a pilot, a leader. People followed her. People flew after her. She was a psychologist. She understood people, and she cared about people. And that is her amazing life. So anything you can do to read about her, to... Uh, uh, find out more. It's a uh, fascinating um, life that is very, very inspiring and also brings us back to a time when we start realizing, wait a sec, if they were the fertilizer, we're, we're what they were fertilizing. All of us, doesn't matter where we live, we're, we're the fruit living in a time that they fertilize. And that puts on our shoulders a huge responsibility to make their fertilizing worth it. And that's uh, one of the great things I'm very thankful to Manya for. So, 